Um, Andy and Kevin are from the Center for African Inclusion, CHIC in Rosa. And yeah, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that uh, excellent introduction. Concise, short and sweet. Just like I like it. Right, if we can get the display up there, please. I can see it on the laptop. Ah, excellent. Right, so this is a two-parter. Andy and I uh, decided to uh, share the talk, uh, which kind of constrains us to 15 minutes each, and I'll try to stick to that. So part one is going to be me talking about um, programming uh, large clusters using the message passing interface in Python. And Andy will talk about using Python for the other big high-performance computing problem, which is big data. So my, my area is number crunching. Right, so that's my title. High performance computing with Python and the MPI for Pi module. The MPI for Pi module is what provides Python with its ability to interface with the message passing interface library. So first of all, what is high performance computing? Well, basically it's the use of parallel computers. And not just ordinary parallel computers, but massively parallel computers. And the idea is to run very advanced applications Efficiently, reliably, and quickly. But reliably is quite important because it turns out when you actually have thousands of calls that uh, your mean time before failure of uh, three years with times a thousand actually means you know every month you're having something go wrong. And the quickly is what we're aiming for, of course. HP si systems are generally perform above a teraflop. I might have to modify the definition to 10 teraflops in the future considering just how powerful laptops are getting nowadays. The fastest machine, the number one machine in the world, is just over six. That's the current induced in the dish, red being a larger current, hotter. Uh, and uh, as you can see where the currents are going. Anyway, uh, other big science. This is what high-performance computing is used for. So there's cosmology, again, something that Meerkat's interested in. That's very interesting, because that's supposed to be the whole universe. Uh, one pixel on there, one particle in the simulation, it happens to be a million galaxies, and each galaxy has a million stars in it. So, you know, really, the universe is huge. And uh, even when you take particles of such large scale, you're still talking about a couple of million particles that you're having to uh, simulate, uh, hence the need for high-performance computing. There's computational fluid dynamics, uh, more down-to-earth problem, well, actually up in the sky, but anyway. Uh, and in this case, this actually happens to be a hypersonic jet design that was simulated at the CHPC. Now, I'm going to just briefly kind of give an overview of uh, cluster computing and its performance. There's a graph of the top 500 list. Uh, the number one is the red curve, right? You can see it sort of jumps every now and then when there's an advance and the number one. But if you look at the number 500, it's a pretty smooth progression. And since this is logarithmic, that tells you that uh, you know it's nice geometric growth in keeping with Moore's law kind of idea. What's interesting <laughs> is that we've gone in 20 years from just under uh, 60 gigaflops to the number one machine now being 16 petaflops. That's an enormous jump in, t in 10 years. Though, of course, many of you will now have uh, smartphones uh, that perform close to a gigaflop. Uh, still remarkable. However, one point I want to make here is that what I'm going to talk about the message passing interface. The whole idea of message passing was actually first developed back in 1990. So this list and this growth here wouldn't exist without the message passing paradigm. And that's because big computers, and basically if you look at the current top 500 list, uh, the CHBC in Cape Town is 497, by the way, so not too impressive, but at least we are still on the list, given that our machine is now two years old. Uh, maybe that's a little more impressive than ever, but we should be upgrading in a year's time. All the machines on the list are cluster-based supercomputers. That means they are clusters of computing units connected <laughs> by networks. So there's a picture of what an actual supercomputer looks like. This is the Sun Constellation Cluster. This is quite an old machine, relatively. Uh, we got this in 2009. Uh, there's over 2,000 uh, Intel Xeon Nehalem cores. It has over 3 terabytes of RAM. 
And it's all connected with quad data rate infinity band. And it has a peak performance of 24 teraflops. So certainly it wouldn't even make it on the five, top 500 list nowadays. But as you can see from the pictures, that basically it's just racks. And if you look at the second, this picture here, which is zoomed in on one area, these are all the compute nodes. So they're very densely packed, as you can see, vertically uh, blades instead of horizontally. Each one of those blades actually has two boards sort of back to back to each other, each board containing two chips, each as a quad core Xeon chip. So that's how you manage to pick, pack over 2,000 cores in uh, that space. There's its overall structure. Don't worry about the detail. And in fact, I deliberately chose a low resolution picture because I didn't want you to try and read the text or anything. The key thing there is this diagram. This is what the machine looks like from an abstract point of view. Basically, what you see it as a programmer. You have a fast network, and you have a whole lot of individual computing nodes connected over that fast network. Each computing node has its own batch of memory and own little disk. Though in the case of uh, our system, the disks are a, a SAN, a storage array network, so they're actually connected over the network. But there's always a little bit of local disk for booting up and for the system and so on. So the challenge when programming your problem across uh, such a machine is because it's a distributed memory system, you have to have some way for the individual processes running on each compute node to be able to communicate with the others. And as I said, just over 20 years ago, a, a standard was established, the Message Passing Interface Standard, MPI. Now, MPI's main goals are provide source code portability. Basically, you get an MPI library, and it's written in C, and you can just about compile it on any system that supports C and, and Linux slash Unix. It allows efficient implementation. It has to be efficient because it's high performance computing. So basically, it has to get access to that network and move stuff from memory to the network back to memory on the other node as efficiently as possible. MPI also offers a great deal of functionality. right? So it does more than just pass messages. It allows you to control processes and do various other things. And importantly, because it's a distributed memory model, it supports heterogeneous. That is, your compute nodes don't have to all be identical. right? Because you're not actually moving executables across. You're just passing messages. And the messages are just pure data. Now, the MPI standard uh, sets both C and Fortran APIs, which is not the purpose of this conference. Fortunately for Python, there are various implementations of MPI modules. And the one I'm going to talk about is called MPI for Pi, which seems to be the most popular at the moment. And it's now hosted on the scipy.org website. So there you go, mpi for pi.scipy.org. So I'm going to first briefly give you an overview of what MPI actually entails, and then I'm going to show you some source code examples. And hopefully, that won't take more than another seven minutes. So the type of communications you have with MPI are two types, point to point or collective. Point to point, as I suggest, always entails a sender and a receiver. One process sends a message that is data. The other process uh, receives it. So only two processes participate. You also have collective communication. So all the processes that have been launched in your MPI run are uh, in a group called a communicator. And so all processes within a communicator, and communicators can be broken down into sub-communicators, can participate in a collective communication. And that's where you do your collective type operations, barrier, reduction, gather, scatter, and so on. And I'll give a few examples of each of these using MPI for Pi. This is the minimal MPI you need to know. Right? First of all, you import the module. And in fact, you want to import the MPI part of the module, because the examples I'm going to use uh, are going to use the MPI standard direct uh, interface. So this is a thin, fast wrapper. Because again, high performance computing, we're worried about performance. There is an MPI init method. You don't need to call that, because the import nicely sets all of that up. Yay for Python and OOP. Under MPI, you have a default communicator called comworld. That's all the processes in your current MPI instance. Right? So that's all of them by default. 
and the standard methods are get size that returns the size of the communicator that is the number of processes you have rank get rank that returns the uh, unique integer identifier of your process then you have the standard send and receive methods for actually passing data around and then lastly when you end everything you have the finalize so that's call minimal MPI and I'll show you an example that uses that hello world of course so basically we use get rank to get the current process so what's actually happening is that this Python program is going to be run on each and every process that has been assigned okay so this is complete peer-to-peer -peer programming you have an identical Python program so the program needs to know which process it is and that's the my rank the unique identifier and then of course the size so all this little MPI program does is it prints out its current rank I've commented out the MPI finalized because most of the time you don't need it as long as the program ends in the same module that did the import everything gets cleaned up nicely by the constructors destructors etc so this is what it looks like if you look at the bottom window if I actually SSH over to the CHPC systems and run it I use the MPI run command with n minus NP I'm just asking for four processes and the name of the executable which is obviously the Python interpreter and then the argument to the executable will be the name of the Python program and each one just r writes out which rank it is and the number of processes the key thing to note of course is that because this is concurrent computing there's no guaranteed order that the results they all running in parallel there's small timing differences so that order is basically random so it's up to use the programmer to impose any kind of order but I'll just show you an example where you would do that explicitly so similarly as before oh I forgot to mention this is a good part to mention it it's because the MPI standard talks about moving around uh, buffers those are just raw blocks of data we use the numpy module to get access to those arrays because there's numpy arrays that basically we move around so in this case there's a little bit of advancement now because now we're actually using the send and receive methods so I'll just go through it step by step you have the tag so each message you pass around gets tagged so even if two processes are communicating several different messages each one would have a different tag so that they would be able to distinguish the, what the data actually means for each other uh, we're just setting up a simple numpy array all zeros character based so it's just going to be bytes and we're also getting a status object and that's just needed for the uh, receive uh, method so we actually don't use it we don't need to check the status because it's such a simple program we do the same as before we get the rank and the size and then we now get to the logic that is distinguishing the actual processes because remember each process is identical so now you have to actually code in that if I'm rank zero I'm a special process so we kind of coding in here explicitly a master client or master slave as you like uh, approach where process zero is the master and so what's happening if I'm not process zero I construct a string with my little message and then I send it so here's the message I'm sending the length plus one null terminated strings remember and you have to tell the MPI library what size of the actual individual elements of the array are that's the destination so you notice I've set destination to zero so all the processes that aren't rank zero will be sending this message to zero and there's of course the tag which in this case is just set to zero else if I'm actually process zero then I have to in turn receive the message from all the other processes so that's why I'm just looping over range one to P well P minus one of course I'm receiving the message the hundred in there because that's the maximum size of the array it's a character the source is what I'm iterating over the tag and that's where the status is which I'm not actually using and then I print out the message so obviously when we run this because of the explicit loop in there we are going to see all those messages in order from 1 to P minus 1 okay 
So there are two types of messages, uh, send and receive methods. The, these are the ones I've just showed you are called blocking, because what happens is the method won't return until the actual message is fully transferred and received on the other end. The examples I'm showing with the capital S and R, those methods are the fast ones, because that's a very thin wrapper around the MPI library. The MPI library itself, remember, is written in high-speed C, so it's very efficient. But because we like to be able to work with Python objects, you can use the lowercase ones, which applies to any Python object. That actually uses pickle under the hood to do the work. Obviously, it's a little bit slower. <coughs> then there's non-blocking, which is essentially buffered. So the I send and I receive methods will actually return immediately because the message you're passing is copied into a buffer, and then it waits for the network to uh, allow it to be sent or received. It has to return a request object so that you can actually check. I'm just again showing you the fast versions using the NumPy arrays. Again, the capital, first letter is capitalized. And the request objects have methods where you can test to see if it's been completed or not. You can actually force a wait, so it would just stop there and wait until it's all. And you can also cancel. So these are various usable combinations. You have send, receives. Blocking and non-blocking can be mixed. You also have a simultaneous send, receive, which will both send and receive a, a message. And you have an all to all, which will send from all the processes to all the processes. All right. Now, let's have a look, quick look at collective communication. So typically, the most commonly used ones are scatter, gather, and reduce. I'll show the scatter, gather first. Scatter is usually used when you initialize everything. So again, you explicitly have to code in some kind of master-slave relationship to initialize all the uh, processes, all the compute nodes, to before starting your computation. So for example, let's say you have to send initial data. So you have a send buffer, which would just be a NumPy array, and that gets divided up into blocks according to the number of processes, and the scatter method just scatters the individual bits to each process in turn, including the root process, which is usually, by convention, process zero, but it doesn't actually have to be. And gather does the opposite. It gathers a whole lot of messages, of data from the other processes, and puts it all into a single array. All right. Uh, those pictures are courtesy of the MPI forum, which I'll just mention now, is the place that actually sets the standard for the MPI interface itself. So there's an example of scatter. I'll just go quickly to the changes now. So I'm just setting up a list here. And I'm notice I'm using the lowercase s, right? So I'm using the one with pickle, so I can just send the list object directly. And root 0 says that the rank 0 process is the root. That's the one that actually contains it. That's why I explicitly have to check if I'm rank 0, if I'm the zero process, then I set up my data list. Otherwise, none. It's empty. And then at the end, I've just put in a cert just to indicate what the result should be after the scatter operation. OK, gathers the opposite way around. Here, I'm setting up individual scalars. They get gathered into a list. And again, I'm using the uh, Python object version, not the fast number way. Right. Then we have collective communications, reduce. There's the kind of operators you have. You can find the maximum, the minimum of this. So basically what you're doing is you're taking values from all the processes, and you're combining them. You're reducing them in some way. And here's a little example, which is a little more complicated. So basically, I have two arrays, which I just fill with ones. And then what I want to do is do a dot product. So I've explicitly defined the serial dot product there. And then down here, you can see what happens is that I break up the arrays according to what rank I am for my process, do the local dot product just over the subset of those arrays, and then combine all the dot products using the sum reduction operator. OK. And then last but not least, the other thing that MPI can do that's quite potent is it can uh, do dynamic process management. You can actually create processes within 
your current set. So here's an example where I spawn a new process. So here I'm explicitly starting with a master process that then spawns some child processes that do the work, the clients as it were. And basically what I'm doing is I'm starting up three processes and that's going to run the cpy.py program. And I'm taking an array, broadcasting it to all of them so that each child process right, will now get a copy of that array. I then execute on that. Uh, well, each child process does some computation. And then what I do is I do a reduction operation, a reduce there, where I sum all the results from all the child processes. And that result is going to be pi to however many decimal places I can achieve. And then last but not least, I disconnect from the sub-communicator that I've set up with all the child processes. And I'll just show you what the child process looks like. Right. So the first thing it does, it, it has to get the communicator from the parent. So that's why you have the get parent method. And then it can do the usual thing of size, rank, and so on. And as you can see here, you have a duplicate broadcast operation, and that is receiving. Because notice that it has the argument root equals 0. So the 0 process, which was the master process, was the one that was actually sending out the information. These are all receiving it. And then you have a little bit of computation, which does a sum that calculates pi. And then its little subsum is sent out to all of the others with the production operation sum. And that's it in a nutshell. And sorry, I hope I haven't taken too long. So thank you very much. And now on to part two with Andy. Andy Rebagliati. I'm working um, at the Center for High Performance Computing, mostly in. Um, whoops, this thing is. Let me just get back to the beginning here. Is it paging on for me? Okay, so I'm at the Marine <coughs> Mer Remote Sensing Unit attached to the Oceanography Department of UCT. And um, what we get is we get a lot of download data from the European Space Agency and um, NASA of Earth observation data, which we need to archive and process. It's basically split up by region around Africa. We've got a website. Um, NetCDF is our intermediate storage format. And we work with CHPC both for the data processing and for the data storage. And it's the storage bit that I'm talking about today. So the system that they have there, they're calling DERISA, which is something about research and something about South Africa. And um, uh, anyway, it's a complicated acronym that they managed to put enough vowels in so you could pronounce it. Um, they call it a petabyte data store. Actually, it's only 700 terabytes. Um, it's a, it's, it's a probably a three-quarter rack um, full of um, two terabyte and three terabyte disks. It's very heavy. So the, it's got a number of different nodes um, in each tray of disks, um, 14 of them. And it's, um, you access it uh, naturally via an API um, across um, a fast network. So one of the things is that you have to specify in the front end of it, you specify your storage domains, as it were. And they call them policies. The policies are mostly to do with their um, replication method 
um, and also they've got some um, serial attached SCSI disks and they've also got some uh, SATA disks so depending on which one you want um, they can subdivide them by that and it all adds up in the end to 700 terabytes so there's uh, local, local replication there's RAID as a choice of, of, of um, redundancy, which is, of course, not replication. It can be just RAID 5-ish. Um, and there's a sister disk cluster up at CSI and Pretoria with um, SANREN connectivity between the two. They haven't turned on the pipe between those two. Um, I'm quite curious as to um, how much they're going to get buried in data just by trying to replicate these two large clusters um, across SANREN. I'm not sure that they realize quite how much data there is there. Um, um, our current usage on the Dorisa there, it, I'm looking at about um, 100 terabytes at the moment, which is like 50 plus terabytes times two. The, the system there, there's the CHPC data cluster that um, Kevin was showing you doesn't currently have um, network access directly to the Dorisa array. I think the plan is, is to just set up a small portion of those machines to have direct network access because this thing can be um, easily overwhelmed by several thousand very fast computers all trying to get stuff off it. So I'm guessing that they're going to set up a subset that can do that access, but there is none at the moment. What I one of the things that um, oops do I have some of these the wrong way around? No, let's just have a look at it. So the to do with the um, the Earth observation data that I'm looking to store, um, I need to have a PostGIS database to store that particular information. We've got um, we need to be able to search by. Um, geographical area, an overlap, an intersection, and this, that, and the other, and PostGIS is the way to go these days. So it's there to store the spatial and temporal metadata of the, so in other words, we've got a swath, it's, it's passing, it's, it's a single satellite um, uh, view over Africa as it passes over, and so I need to be able to store the boundaries of that swath and um, what time it passed over the various areas. So, and that has to store that in the PostGIS database. I also index it by the file name that um, NASA or ESA give me. And the uh, WAS is, the, is the, the storage array, the Dorisa storage array. It's the web object storage or something like that, which is an object ID which I give it, um, which allows me to um, specify it. Um, so the object store is just storing the raw data itself because the object store itself is very simple. And on the website that I use for the front end, I've got a Python Django website. This is the, the schema for that, just to quickly run through it. There's a file name, a path, and an extension. There's a shape, which is a geograph geographic ex shape. In other words, this is not just a polygon shape. This is a shape on a, on a sphere, uh, an oblate sphere that is... Um, uh, an approximation of the Earth. There's um, a geo manager, which is um, something just to f to mark this class as something that can be accessed by the GIS geography um, operations. And there's a few other little bits and pieces, including the overpass time and the um, the WAS object ID, which is the thing that I'm using to store in the big data store. And then the orbit number, which is a useful thing um, for me to be able to um, index into the the satellite data. Now, I'm just, just checking to see. I seem to have missed a slide somewhere here. My apologies. Okay. One of the things that I just need to just run over with the, um, the, wet, the Dorisa object store is its blob data storage, what I call blob data storage. You just give it a blob and it gives you back an object ID. There's no search, there's no index, there's nothing like that. Okay? That object ID, which is a big long hex number that looks like an MD5 string, is what you store. And if you want that data back again, you present the, um, the, 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 the object ID to the data store, and it will return the blob. So when they call it a database, it's a bit of a euphemism. I just call it blob storage. Um, so the, the API is, um, 
there's a there's a, a Python API and there's a C API and there's a Fortran API. The only one I think that we're interested in here is the Python API. Um, and it's got a constructor which is used um, in your code to connect to the cluster. So it's the the handle that is used for, for all subsequent communication. Um, all of the 14 nodes can um, receive this information. So in other words, you can access this in parallel to all 14 nodes, and it will resolve all of that internally. And it's good for load balancing and um, um, other bits and pieces. So you just give it the um, IP address, or basically the the DNS name of the cluster itself, um, which can be Ryan Robin. So, what have we got? We've got an API to create the object. So first of all, this is just a simple indication of creating. If I've got any code here, I've taken out all the error correction and this, that, and the other. Otherwise, all your text would be very small, and you'd be looking at things that you know all about. So first of all, we create our object. It's got a, um, a data part, which is um, where you put all the data, or your blob, or your satellite data, which is just bas basically Python stuff. It's got a metadata. You can put a series of um, uh, tuples of um, uh, string and um, value, like key and value, f as, a, as a metadata. Again, not searchable. This is just simply stored with the blob. If you present the 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 object ID, you can get back that metadata, but it's not doing anything clever with it other than store it. Um, and then there's a policy. The policy is just a named policy. That what the actual policy does is set up somewhere else. This is named replicate, which is just a single replication, but that, that it could mean RAID 5 or anything you like. And you can then put that um, object into the data store. And it returns the object ID. And the object ID is what you'd store in a rather more useful database, which is the PostGIS database. So if you're going to retrieve, um, all fairly simple, we're just going to present it with the object ID, and we're going to return our object. And the object will have both a data and um, a metadata portion to it that we can access. And we've got a delete. So if you want to get rid of it, you can delete it. Now, one of the uh, limitations of this fairly simple API is there is um, cursory accounting. There's very, you can check by policy how much data is stored in this um, data store um, by policy. If you lose your object ID, it just becomes trash at the bottom of the data store. Um, you can also put, there's a system where you can reserve a poli uh, an object ID, and then you can um, present it and, and put it onto the data store. There is also a streaming API, which is the one that I use. If you've got very large data, you're not going to be like storing big chunks of um, 700 megabytes of um, raw data. We'd like to chunk through it in pieces. And it has a basically a get stream and a put, tree, put stream class. So you instantiate it, it's, which is now associated with, uh, with talking to the, to the object store. You then um, do multiple calls through that particular object. And then you've got a, a, a close, which will then return the object ID, which you can then store away. And it has got, if you want to, you can, you can um, reserve an object ID so you get the object ID first. And then you can store stuff with it if you prefer to do it that way. Um, and again, it's got a, um, a metadata component, component which when you're fetching, you can decide whether you want to get the metadata, or if you want to get the data itself, or if you want one or the other, or both. We, so this, for instance, is the streaming API. Um, again, with no error checking or anything like that. I was just trying to have it so that you could actually see it on the screen. So for instance, we're opening a file, and we create a, um, a put stream um, with a named policy, and we can then give some metadata to it, and then we can read it like from a regular file system, because that top line there is just a simple um, open file command. And then we can just uh, write the data out, and then we close it. And as we close it on the stream, it returns our object ID. And that object ID is something that if we lose it, we've lost our object. Um, I Just a couple of screens, just a couple of um, routines here 
most of the data that we store in the data store of, is, of course, compressed. Um, and when we want to use it, we usually want to use it uncompressed. And so um, I had a, um, this would, is something where I'm basically stacking um, the, the Zlib um, compression um, methods on top of the, the, the WAS uh, stream reading commands. So basically, I'm opening my file. I'm opening up a compression object, um, which I'm calling Z there. And then I'm reading my files off. And then I'm writing it, but I'm writing not the, the data itself. I'm writing a decompressed version of that data, again, as a, um, doing a block compression. And I need to, fl uh, after I've um, read all of my data, I then need to flush my, my compression object. And then I can close the file. Now, um, one of the things that I was experimenting with um, that um, was to see if I could actually make that a little bit more Pythonic by just simply creating a single file here. And so what I was trying is I was trying, trying the gzip file. So then in other words, that I could just open the, um, the, the, the gzip file directly using the wasstream object itself. But I found that the, the API that the vendor gives us with this data store has no tell uh, method on its uh, file stream that uh, basically meant that the compression object, which wished to use it, um, wouldn't allow me to do it. So that was a bit of a shame. But that's um, the nuts and bolts of um, uh, how, how I'm storing data in and out of the petabyte data store at the Center for High Performance Computing. Thank you very much. I guess we, I guess we could do the questions in reverse order to, to um, Oh, can we? All right. Okay, yeah, but then he can hear me and I can't, but that's fine. We can wave things around. Any questions? Yes. Um, a good question, and it was my complaint to the vendor. I said there's a serious problem here. Um, they upgraded the firmware on the whole thing. Um, and gave uh, supervisory access where you could list all the object IDs in the data store. And therefore, there was a, a longhand way of figuring out um, the ones that you dropped. But um, no, it's uh, my issue with the system that they've given it to us at the moment is there's no accounting. The CHPC have a serious problem. That there's no quotas. They're thinking, ah, and he's going to use it all in no time at all. Um, and also um, uh, that, that there can be accidents like dropping things to the floor and um, leaving trash in the bucket. Yeah. It's Postgres with a, geost with a uh, geographic information systems plugin um, on top of it that allows you to do geography operations. Um, I'm not that clever. I'm still on the SQL path. Well, I'm, I'm not familiar with this, but I can answer that. Oh, thanks. <laughs> I can answer um, the, the, the reason for MPI, uh, uh, which might answer your question, is that MPI has uh, the lineage. I mean, it's been used for over 20 years now. It's mature. It's designed for high-performance systems, so it's very efficient. Uh, so hence, because when you build a supercomputer cluster, you first thing you install on it is MPI. Uh, most HPC applications are using MPI. So it's a natural fit for doing HPC with Python. As far as I know, all the other competing technologies that have popped up over the years have, have just not managed to outlast MPI. It seems to have really withstood the test of time in that respect. Oh, 
Oh, absolutely. That's what Beowulf is. And that's why you have things like Oscar and Rocks. You know, build your own cluster and uh, put it up. Those all use MPI. Uh, the two big MPI libraries, OpenMPI and MPitch, are both open source. So anybody can download them, build them for your system. Uh, not only do they support Ethernet, gigabit Ethernet and so on, they also support InfiniBand. And if you go to um, uh, the various vendors who have, I mean, they're much more expensive than an um, Ethernet switch, but InfiniBand switches are fairly affordable if you're a small research group. And then you put together quite a useful system, in fact. It's actually launched by the scheduler. So if you remember my first example, I showed the MPI run command. That's, uh, that's an MPI uh, executable that comes with the library. And it's one of only four commands that come with MPI. The other main one is MPI exec, which gives you some finer control over that. So basically, you're using the system itself to launch the actual commands, the executables, which in this case is the Python interpreter on each machine. The job submission is Moab. Yeah, the job submission system is Moab. If you're using Oscar or Rocks to build your own, you're going to have Maui and Talk, which are open source equivalents. Yeah. Question at the back there? Yeah. I, I'm sorry, say that again? Yes. Um, because um, th th that's what's there. The, 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 the other alternative that they're looking to provide is NFS. Um, the problem I see with NFS, so NFS will be hiding the, um, the, the, the limitations of the, the API there and putting um, a, a accounting and um, all those other lovely things. But now we've got a single press of bottleneck instead of at least having 14 nodes that I can access it through. Um, it wasn't my choice as to what they put there. Um, what I do like about it um, is that it's simple. Um, uh, complexity always makes things difficult. The, it's, I think, perfect for um, like single user applications. If you're a, a library and you're archiving something, this looks perfect. The CHPC has a multi-user. Um, uh, there's a lot of people that would like to, to use space on this system. And um, it doesn't look like the API is up to it, in my opinion, um, because basically of the accounting. It works great, hasn't lost any of my data. <laughs> <laughs>